This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Cyber Frontiers, show number 65, recorded on February 16th, 2022. Here on Cyber Frontiers, we explore cybersecurity, big data, and the technologies that are shaping the future. If you have questions, uh, comments, or contributions, you can always send us an email. You can send me an email, jim at theaverageguy.tv, or you can uh, send one over to Christian if you want to do that. It's actually more efficient that way, Christian at theaverageguy.tv. Find me on Twitter at Jay Collison. Of course, Christian, you can find him at Borg Whisperer. Theaverageguy.tv is powered by Maple Grove Partners. Get secure, reliable, high-speed hosting from folks that you know and trust for more information and for plans reasonably priced when everything else is following the path of inflation maple grove partners.com christian uh welcome back to cyber frontiers i can successfully say on this podcast we never said 2021 <laughs> ever <laughs> welcome back welcome back into 2022 but we also said that it's uh always up to date but never on a schedule so yeah we, we, we used to we, we used continue to... that trend as well <laughs> We did. We did say that for a while. We uh, we got back together and said, we got to do this. I'm going to get you on the calendar at least once a month. That just seems to be. And I think I get you a couple months at a time scheduled out. So we at least hit it. And then I'll probably produce these um, on the off uh, week during the week when I'm uh, when we're not doing um, home gadget geeks. So we'll get that set. And if you're if you're joining us back, if you're joining us for the first time, you're like, well, wait a minute, there's 64 episodes ahead of this yeah there are you can go back uh we've been doing this for a long time a couple of year and uh and um been having a good time doing it if you're joining us uh, maybe from home gadget geeks maybe you heard me talk about this on home gadget geeks or it just showed up in your feed again uh, welcome back we'll try and have these kind of once a month uh, or so for you christian i ca- catch us up a little bit we we spent a little time with you on home gadget geeks but from a big data big data cybersecurity standpoint Give us a, why don't you just give us kind of a rundown? I mean, the last time we met, October of 2020, we had Bitdefender on. We were talking a little bit about what they were doing, but man, a lot has changed since, since October of 2020. I, I'm not asking for a complete rundown, but just give me some, you know, give me some highlights. Yeah. I mean, um, a tremendous amount has changed, right? From, you know, March 2020, which I really think of as, uh, you know, February, March 2020 is really kind of the, the landing zone nexus target of um, COVID in the United States. And just looking at um, some of those early predictions we had about, you know, I, I remember when we, in some of the last episodes, we talked about um, really just kind of things that would seem mundane to us on any other show or topic that suddenly became really important, right? Like, well, does the internet have enough infrastructure in the U S to handle everyone working from home? I don't know. Let's find out. Everyone's working from home now. It's shut down. Um, and we've seen kind of dr- quick dramatic evolutions in enterprise industrial preferences for what it means to be a remote worker uh, what the telework space environment looks like. We probably accelerated at least 10 years in adoption timeframes and, uh, you know, companies by and large for the positions that can do it have taken much more aggressive stances and basically um, being able to hire and retain talent is now uh, one facet of that optimization curve, so to speak, is whether or not you offer remote work and, and how does it compare up to these other companies? So, um, with that change in cultural mindset has come a lot more thinking about, well, really how ready are we to have sensitive work conversations at home, handle work, um, technology at home, secure mobile devices, secure corporate networks, data, assets, systems, and processes. Um, And these are things we've all talked about on the show. Um, But I think one of the areas that has advanced the most in the discussion thread is this notion of zero trust, which, you know, we've talked about for before, where it's no longer um, sufficient just to, you know, trust the boundaries of networks and, and to kind of build these, um, you know, castle walls of different, different levels of networks and, and access to systems. But 
we really have to assume zero trust from the outset and um, really place very little to no trust in the actual infrastructure environment that you're in front of or behind, but into the identity, the presence, the actions um, that you're using to authenticate and identify yourself and, and perform actions within the system. And that has had fairly large implications for where industry is going in this space. We still, I don't think, have hit the maturity curve of, of zero trust, but we started to hit a I would say a common reference point or a common framework by which people are digesting the requirements and what it really means to say, oh, we're a zero trust architecture, right? That was a very kind of buzzwordy generic thing in the past. And I think in the last year, year and a half, we've started to get a lot more fidelity around it and arguably much quicker than we would otherwise because of the necessity of supporting these hybrid environments, which... Is, is everything I think folks can tell is a, is a long-term trend, right? We're going to have industry and and the alike have to support these environments, um, and they're going to they're going to span people's home networks, people's office networks, people's data centers. It's going to span, you know, cloud infrastructure and off-premise and on-premise. Um, so, fairly important topic. We've also seen in the last year um, a fairly um, I don't know if I would call it disturbing, but we've, I think, certainly seen a regression in the types of zero-day vulnerabilities we're seeing in mobile, um, particularly, you know, where I used to, I, I've hit, you know, Google Android fairly hard on the show in the past around just the multitude of concerns from a privacy security perspective and, and how those things weren't consistently implemented across different, you know, vendors that consume Android. Um, but we've been seeing it uh, a lot more so in iOS in the last year, which is to me a concerning trend. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm an iPhone user. Um, it's, you know, you, to some extent, it's a you get what you pay for in terms of you're paying a premium on the hardware and the OS. So that advertising and these other things kind of baked into the Android kernel in some ways is not there as much. Um, Apple has made huge splash waves in privacy that go much further than I think they thought uh, in the mobile industry would go. Um, which is certainly a development since the last show, uh, particularly around, um, you know, we've seen a 30% uh, decline in uh, Facebook's uh, share price with a poor revenue outlook for this year. And one of the really telling things was that, you know, part of what they attribute that to is, well, you know, the Apple app store and iOS platform is killing us because, you know, you can turn on all these privacy things that disable ad tracking and these other things that basically are a major revenue stream for the company. Um, so while they've had major success uh, moving the privacy narrative in that aspect, they've also had, in my opinion, an unusual number of zero days in relation to previous years that our definitional um, arbitrary remote code execution requiring no human interaction. And there's been a fairly interesting patch cycle from iOS 13 through iOS 15 of, you know, several critical OSs where you must upgrade this thing now. And no, your phone isn't going to be on a corporate network unless you have this version. And, you know, um, not a trend that you would see as, as often with iOS. Um, and I think that just speaks to we're not there yet in terms of, you know, we, we talk about data breaches as kind of this iconic holistic thing of early 2010 through 2015 as like, it felt like we were reading about a new data breach every single day. And a lot of the web-based technologies are getting smarter and, and, and hardened to the point where that became lesser of a focus. And then it kind of, you know, ransomware picked up from 2016 through the rest of that decade to kind of round out the new class of problems and security in terms of the low hanging fruit for an adversary. And now we're here in um, 2022 and we're still seeing 
a lot of really nasty, you know, security issues across different device platforms that haven't gotten any less significant in scope. But it does still seem like we're on a broader trend of preventing these kind of mass data breaches, um, you know, worldwide worming type of behavior, ransomware, et cetera. But for the average consumer, as well as the enterprise, like there's still a lot of cat and mouse going on in security. And so I think that's just an important trend to kind of continue to follow and understand because we still haven't had a paradigm or a fundamental shift in some type of technology that fundamentally changes the game of how we think about security. It still feels very iterative, very like patching holes and sinking ships sometimes. And uh, we kind of hope zero trust in these other things are going to really get at the kind of foundational tech debt of the internet and technology to start addressing some of these problems. But, you know, think longer term horizon, like five to 10 years to start to see the impacts of some of those things. Um, I still think we're in a, in a horizon where there's going to be plenty of fun, so to speak, and what we see as problem areas for the industry um, over the next few years. Um, and, and these topics are just uh, really kind of in the security space and the telework space of COVID. There's obviously been fairly, you know, um, decent progress across artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, I feel like Tesla is the classic case study and, and what Elon Musk is doing both in the car automation space as well as other um, industries that he's um, you know, championing, particularly with Starlink and Neuralink. And some of these things are more controversial than others. But um, there's a lot going on in that space that is starting to smell a little bit different. Um, so that's cool. Um, broadly speaking, though, the accessibility and the usability of machine learning has gone up even more so. I mean, through 2021 was a big year for that. I feel like we are at a point where when we started this show, ML was something that academic researchers got in a room and wrote papers about. And in 2022, ML is something where regular enterprises are submitting their data to cloud-based workflows and getting useful statistics and insights out of their data that's actionable business information um, without having to have a whole lot of rigor and background knowledge in machine learning. So that's a in my opinion, a major milestone for the maturity of that topic. Um, and then we covered this on uh, Home Gadget Geeks more from a consumer perspective. And I think it's great to go back and listen to that show um, to kind of understand some of the fundamentals. But the whole space around Internet of Things, enterprise networking, kind of what is the next evolution of the Internet, both from an infrastructure perspective as much as a web application perspective, is really starting to come into focus and um, provide new opportunities that support the type of workplace cultures that we're talking about and kind of home environment just as much as, as the uh, industrial and enterprise uh, facets. So... Yeah, lo lots of incremental progress. Nothing that is, you know, show stopping. Oh my gosh, this is the best thing since sliced bread that we missed. Um, but kind of just a high level surveil of where I think we are heading mm. into um, kind of Q2 of 2022. You, uh, in that Home Gadget Geek show, you talked me into a 5G router, uh, completely wireless. I've now been for, I don't know, for a month or two month and a half maybe 5g can't tell the difference uh I picked up a, a, a ipv6 address to begin with and then it was gone <laughs> as quickly <laughs> it was there it was gone i'm back you know picking up very random uh they change a lot more than than uh, cox does or did for me those addresses would stick around a while these don't seem to but we're using it right now and it, it seems rock solid we maybe we can talk about that a little bit more i want to come back to this uh a report in 2021 the year we we kind of skipped a 68 percent increase in data compromises like 68 percent christian and and i think we're probably off to a pretty good start for 2022 as well is that like is that a trend would that have been different if we wouldn't have had a pandemic would that have been any different or is that just the direction we're heading that i mean at some point 
everything's going to be co- going to be compromised, right? I mean, if, if when you talk about a seventy percent increase in a year, um, what? Well, yeah, you, you know, you say zero trust, but I mean, what's it going to take to to slow this trend down? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting because my perspective on this in relation to the statistical data you read is interesting, right? I think in the aggregate, we're doing a better job of as industry at large of tamping down on these things. And yet the raw numbers basically say, hey, data compromises were, you know, 23 and a half percent higher in 2021 than they were in 2017. So, like, how do you reconcile that data with the, the viewpoint? Right. And. Um, one thing I like to think about is do you have many small sinking ships or do you have several large sinking ships? And what, what's interesting in unfolding some of this data is that I think there's a lot of small to medium sized companies that are struggling that are increasing these numbers. And part of that is what I, you know, it's like a, it's a failed plumbing and failed infrastructure problem, right? Like, um, you can have these companies spending their time trying to build foundational services, security capabilities for their, their business without necessarily having the on-site expertise to do it. Um, or you can, you know, kind of outsource those things to known trusted solid platforms that implement it correctly every single time and build your business logic application on top. And obviously there's, shared security implications there that are not always clear to digest in raw numbers. But um, you're absolutely right that like the ransomware played a big role in the increase of what people consider to be data compromises. Um, But then there's also um, an alarming number of just breaches and, and, there's, there's not much to say other than I think in, in some respects, the level of complexity that we're at needs to change. So like we're getting more complex in how we think about implementing these systems and the, what I call the blueprints or like the, the solution, the technology solutions we have available to address these problems are dramatically better than they were 10 years ago when we were talking about data breaches. But now we have kind of an implementation and a deployment problem where are we consistently implementing and consistently deploying these blueprints across small, medium, large institutions. And I think that that is to me in my mind where, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about, um, you know, A, um, are we consistent as a whole in how to provide real defensive security postures for these systems and have them fail closed and not open. Um, And then there's just the reality of, you know, um, the adversary has to try harder. And, and that is because that low hanging fruit is no longer really as easy in 2022 as it was in 2012. Um, And when the adversary has to try harder, um, you're going to see more sophisticated and complex attacks that are going to require those next generation of technologies to, to protect, right? So this is really kind of part of that cat and mouse where now we're starting to see the next evolution of breaches and ransomware and et cetera. And it's a, it's an, a result of, I think we got to that next rung in the like, aggregate infrastructure of the internet and security. And that, that has closed a lot of the low hanging fruit. And now the response is, well, the attacks are going to get more sophisticated. So I think that's where you see the the increase uh, being driven from. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure that folks really um, can appreciate yet what the right thing is to double down and focus on first, right? So like two of the big attacks that happened in 2021 that weren't covered on the show is one, um, Colonial Pipeline, right? Which is a gas pipeline in um, 
um, southeast part of the U.S., right, Ma major supplier. Um, and so, you know, gas stations were closing or $8 a gallon, et cetera. And that was a classic ransomware attack. And then they kind of got the money back. And there's some questions there that um, will remain unanswered, I think. Um, uh, but, you know, impressive for the first time ever I can think of where a ransom attack of that magnitude resulted in the Department of Justice announcing that its extortion task force had recovered, you know, uh, $2.3 million of the ransomware payment. Um, so that's fairly interesting, right? That's not a very common headline that you read that you get anything back after um, paying a ransom. And shortly after Colonial, it was like clockwork was the um, the meatpacking um, company, JBS, had kind of the same business disruption. Um, and so, again, we see ransomware kind of replacing the traditional type of breach as a mainline news story. And we see it having the kind of broad impacts that we expect and are concerned with. But it, it, it really is a hard commentary to draw the line between um, what would have been the right thing to secure that colonial pipeline over the oodles of other pipelines that are out there um, and, and what would have been the right set of technologies to, to balance kind of that fully hardened model from the realities of the business as they run it today. So a lot of challenges. Um, and I think we're going to continue to see them until there's broader consensus on what's the minimum set of technologies and frameworks that a business should have to operate in order to be in that industry, right? So if you're in critical infrastructure um, and you're running a pipeline, um, you probably should have a standard set of requirements that are set by CISA at DHS to, to, to be in business and to do, if you want to do things that have computers plugged into to pipelines, then you need to meet a certain set of requirements and demonstrate cybersecurity controls much in the same way. If you want to run a commercial data center today, you have to pass a SOC audit, right? Or otherwise customers aren't going to trust the physical security of their data being protected in the cloud. So, um, we have a lot of standardization work to do as industry. And I think, again, that's that's where the next battle is going to be, is where we were lacking technical tools to solve a lot of these problems five years ago. Now I think we have these tools, but we don't yet have broad consensus on the, the standardization and the way forward. Christian, last year, two crypto networks returned. Well, one last year, one this, as we think of the, uh, the Poly Network hacker that returned $600 million or yeah. something like that. There's yeah. some question. Uh, three and then recently here, just at the beginning of this month, $3.6 billion recovered by the Department of Justice on, on something from oh, a couple of years back. Is crypto any different in this area that the, the, we seem to be to have these high profile <laughs> where the hack you, you, the hackers are returning this like, uh, I don't know, you know, because of its openness, because of its ability for people to kind of fixate on the blockchain. Does that matter at all in this space? In our, our, are we seeing crypto being tested in the same way that some of these other, you know, ransomware um, type schemes are being tested? And does that bode well for crypto to see some of this money find its way back? I don't know. Can you, any thoughts on that? You know, it, it's interesting because, I mean, we've talked about what is the level of maturity you need to trust in the assurance of something that claims to afford better security. And so we've, I, you know, been talking for years about how, blockchain as a technology underlying crypto, you know, has represented this great leap forward as a technology capability to do decentralized ledgers and to provide security features that you can't get in a centralized model. Um, and yet we've seen um, the promises associated with cryptocurrencies operating on top of those um, have yet kind of, you know, there's there's no silver bullet 
um, for, for security there that, you know, these exchanges have vulnerabilities in them themselves. And even in blockchain, um, the attacks are there. They vary in their complexity. Some are security related issues. Some are privacy related issues. Um, but you know, I don't, when, when Bitcoin first came out and people thought is, you know, wait a second, this is going to be bulletproof. It's not going to be traced. Like we, you can trace things in the ledger, but you can't attribute necessarily. Um, and a lot of that, that script has been flipped. I mean, you don't, you don't have, you don't have, um, a recovery of money in a, in a, in a, uh, cryptocurrency without some of those concerns being very real, um, and we've seen several cases in the last couple of years of people losing millions of dollars they had in these, in these currencies, um, based on vulnerabilities in the exchange. And so mm -hmm. it raises a lot of questions about, well, how much trust do you put in something that really isn't insured and vetted to what standard, right? Like cryptocurrency has been assessed again by a lot of people from various angles, but the blockchain was the focus because that's what the standard was. Well, what was the standard though for now all these different exchanges and currencies popping up and leveraging that technology? And are they implementing them all in the same ways? And well, can we really identify the differences between how one currency is implemented from another? And when none of these things are regulated or insured um, to nearly the extent that traditional you know, financial systems are, um, it makes you kind of wonder, like we've taken this great leap forward, but are we going to start plugging ships again? Because we, we didn't agree on standards and, you know, it's, it's kind of like the, the age old problem in technology where you go, you go read, I, I, the internet task force bulletins, or you read RFCs and we're using RFCs in parts of industry today that have been in draft for 30 years. And yet it's the best thing that we have as a standard. And that's what gets implemented. Um, and then people, despite all having the same paper in front of them, reading what the standard is, uh, they go ahead and implement that standard in slightly modified ways from what's written. And this results in, um, non-deterministic unexpected behavior. So, um, from that perspective, it's, it's an ongoing, uh, education campaign. And then really we wonder, um, you know, do we have structural or infrastructure issues um, with blockchain? And do we really understand who the miners are, who's running these servers, what financial policies are regulating these exchanges, like who actually owns the data when it's decentralized? You know, there's a lot of questions there we really haven't unpacked as a society and we're making it up as we go along and watching the consequences fall out. Um, so, yeah, um, it, it's it's not only interesting from a fact that Bitcoin has gone almost purely speculative at this point, like it's unclear if we're in gambling territory with it or if it's just, you know, kind of the favorite thing that someone wants to bet a thousand dollars on versus an actual real mature currency system. Um, but the technology has showed it is mature enough to not only catch the eyes of you know, every, every major government, but, you know, you're looking at the U S considering, uh, issuing their own digital currency now. Well, why is that? Because they're trying to assert themselves in the narrative and discussion of, well, Hmm. Um, we don't think this financial technology revolution is going away anytime soon, but we better have an answer that does have some of the regulation and insurance and other aspects that, people expect of a traditional financial system that have arguably been lacking in, in today's kind of lesser wild west but still modestly wild with uh, occasional dust storms rolling through um uh <laughs> which is what we see today well you're you're absolutely right the exchange network whatever that is is the weak link on this we've created this you know that we've created these currencies these you know whatever you want to call them and then people were like, well, you know, we want to do things with them. And the, the exchanges have just been a mess. I mean, they, uh, they, you watch them in every currency kind of, kind of come. We we're probably on V3 at this point, I think, when we think about 
the ones that have survived. And I think there is quite a bit of scrutiny now um, happening on them. They do seem better than they were before, but I am, you know, there's just a lot of shenanigans going on out there. And it's just, it, it's, I, I don't think it's, it's right for the average consumer at this point. Just, it's completely ununderstandable for them. And they're just like, uh, you know, what happens if I lose my password? <laughs> You know, you're like, well, okay, that's, that's probably the wrong um, question uh, to ask. Um, Google recently automatically, I think, again, in our time that we were away, automatically two-factored 150 million email addresses and have seen in this time, you know, 50%, um, it's halved the, the Gmail hacks that they've seen in the past. They've seen a, a decrease by half. Is that where we're going to have to go, Christian, when we think about the consumer footprint? Are we going to have to be more, um, you know, are we going to have to pull out the dad card? <laughs> Say, no, you're going to put two-factor on these things, right? I mean, what's the real, from, from a consumer standpoint, what's the real answer to continue? Because the consumer continues to be the weak link. In a lot yeah, of and, and it's uh, honestly, I think the MFA thing is inevitable. I, I think we're going to be at a point where people are MFAing into their um, desktops and laptops at home the same way they would at work. I think you know you're already seeing things like iOS that can do face, you know, face login. That's one form of factor. Maybe there's going to be a second factor. Um, yeah. Um, short story there is that like personal habits are going to be forced to change, but it's not just Google that's doing this, right? Like one of the big um, maybe shocks to many home consumers was, wait, my computer that I bought four years ago is not compatible with Windows 11 because this TPM chip is missing or what? Um, and so like even, even, you know, Microsoft has really raised the bar to say, wait a second, like you're not, you're not going to like, this operating system was built to a certain bar and it requires a certain set of hardware. And in almost every other release of the Windows operating system, it's been about like meeting a minimum set of system requirements. And now those minimum set of requirements kind of look not so minimum. They just look like requirements, right? Um, so I think you're going to see a lot of changes, you know, with Windows 11, for example, if you're mandating TPM, like now we're talking about everyone's hard drive being encrypted at rest by default, right? Like I'm not going to be able to walk in your house, pull out the hard drive of your computer and start reading your data. Like where's the decryption key, right? So those are things that we wouldn't have been talking about even two years ago, I think. Um, and then, you know, you have this class of vulnerabilities that um, took the world by storm in the end of 2021 with log4j, which was practically earth shattering. I mean, everyone was running around crazy for several days, patching all of the things because, um, you know, Java is used on over 3 billion devices, 3 billion. It's probably more than that by now. And um, when you have 3 billion devices all running Java and many software, you know, folks using common shared open source libraries like for log4j that has uh it's this beautiful zero day remote executable vulnerability waiting for everyone um even that gets you to this place where um it's an example of a more complex threat that had broad impacts um where mfa wasn't going to help you right so it's like there's this weird there's this weird scale we're tilting right now where, again, the low hanging fruit is going to keep going down because you're going to be pulling the dad card out more and more. And it's like, yeah, you're not going to log into an IMAP server without 2FA or a code generation. Um, you're not going to use a machine that doesn't just decrypt at rest by default. Um, but we still don't, you know, we still have... Um, I think a lot of work to figure out what are the standard set of things that prevent the types of vulnerabilities that we saw last year. Log4j being, I mean, one of the classic examples. And seemingly off the news cycle already. Like, yeah, I, I mean, you know? Uh, per, per, you know, classic mainstream media of cover for three days by storm and then disappear into the night. But yeah, um, yeah. in terms of, you know, industry that's been working on this, you know, um, 
it was like a week of around the clock efforts, I'm sure for, you know, most everyone around the world trying to patch their Java things and, you know, the fallout in the, in the technical and the security industry for this is, you know, people are having interesting debates around open source versus closed source. And like, what's the right, like, how do you trust your software supply chain? Right. Like that's a huge topic right now. in mm -hmm. in terms of, um, you know, is it better for me to write all my own libraries and introduce my own bugs because I'm trying to recreate fundamental infrastructure or do we continue to trust these open source packages that everyone uses, scrutinize them closely. And when inevitably human fallacy does get introduced, we have quick mechanisms to stop the bleeding, um, which was put to the test with log 4 J like no other, right? Like how do you stop the bleeding immediately? Um, but, you know, these vulnerabilities are going to remain. And, um, you know, like I noted with iOS, where the number of zero day RCEs has gone uncomfortably up, like that is a good driving example of how low hanging fruits continuing to go down, complexity and motivation to carry out these sophisticated attacks is going up. And um, you know, with that, the blast radius is uh, still fairly volatile, um, mm -hmm. because yes, log four J had this huge blast radius in terms of everyone was impacted more or less. Um, but do we really have good data on how many people were materially impacted who maybe didn't patch in time, or maybe it was used before it was disclosed? Like, that data is much more ambig uh, ambiguous, right? Whereas the data we were looking at before was we couldn't do basic security as an industry. And so data breaches were left and right. And the material impact was very easy to measure because it was, well, here's everyone's social security number, bank account login, et cetera. John's got a question uh, out there in the chat in we're talking earlier and, and I'm going to morph this question a little bit, but he says, is that security posture proof being driven by the cyber uh, insurance industry as well? And it's just as we think about this becoming more and more of a big financial deal for organizations, mm -hmm. not just cyber insurance, but insurance in general of thinking about companies you know, taking out policies to protect themselves from this kind of activity. And then, of course, insurance companies are always the ones that are able to enact <laughs> like they become because it's it, because it, they see the monetary impact it has on them and their success. They get these things kind of taken care of. Is that happening at all in the in the in the cyberspace? Are we seeing insurance companies driving some innovation or driving change or? Um, uh, helping enforce some of that because they know it's in their financial best interest. Yeah. It, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, you know, it, it is similar to the health insurance industry, right? Where is, the, you know, is the health insurance industry allowed to charge you more money now for things like pre-existing conditions or should they be allowed to collect data on how many times you exercise a week to help determine whether or not your premium is higher or lower? It's much the same argument in many respects. Now that has more of a personal privacy aspect to it than the, the cyber insurance argument. But, um, you know, insurance is absolutely a, a game of how much measured risk can I handle against the pot of money? And am I, is my risk higher than, than what is insured? And so I absolutely expect those conversations are happening. It's unclear to me at what level they are driving the conversation right now. Uh, but the reputational damage of a company alone is sufficient that I don't think they need an insurance industry necessarily convincing them that they, you know, need to be doing things because it takes one, you know, major issue and you've, you know, rep potentially, you know, reputationally, da reputationally damaged your company or your product or your service to a point where no one's going to use it and trust is, um, hard to gain and easy to lose. So unlike, you know, health insurance where um, maybe individuals do or don't need more motivation to take care of themselves, but insurance providers have largely been handcuffed from 
crossing some of the data privacy and boundary laws to um, handle um, putting someone on their their plan with cyber insurance um, you know it, it I, I'm, I'm absolutely I mean you know and John brings up a good point that's like you know some insurance companies aren't going to even um, agree to cover you unless you have basic things like 2FA but if you're looking for cyber insurance chances are you're a large enough enterprise at that point that you should have these things. And if you don't, um, it's interesting that you are looking for the insurance before those things are in place. Because to me, that says you think insurance is the answer um, moreover than the investment in your infrastructure to protect your customers. Um, So I'm not, it's unclear how much of that is a CYA move. I think insurance has, maybe a role to play in the conversation, but I don't think they are the right entity to be kind of driving the minimum set of policies. Um, there, you know, uh, for all the great regulatory things we come up with in the, in the United States, this seems like a, a ripe area for regulation that is currently maybe under-regulated um, and would benefit from, you know, we have a lot of standard set of guidance that people can choose to follow or not to follow, but there's not a lot of mechanisms for regulatory reform that ensures that those standards are being implemented when you are enacting in certain types of business at the state level, this looks actually pretty different, um, because some States are taking a much more proactive policy on, on passing laws that, hold companies at much greater level of uh, liability for cyber breaches. They also hold companies at um, liability for failures to have um, disaster recovery plans, business continuity plans, um, cybersecurity incident response plans. And so like, uh, you know, New York State's a classic example where you pretty much can't operate anything nonprofit, for profit otherwise, unless you have a documented disaster recovery and business continuity plan on file with the organization. Um, And, you know, there's um, the next level up is focused on the cybersecurity aspect and the data breaches, et cetera. Um, so there are some levers starting to appear and, uh, insurance maybe is one that's accessible to everyone, but it's, I'm not seeing any clear or consistent lever that applies across industry to really get folks to the table. John wants to counter your your statement there about reputation, your reputation argument with the RSA intrusion from a few years back. RSA came through fine despite security being their business. Thoughts on that? Yeah, um, it, it is an interesting counter data point. I think one of the things that make RSA in a different position from other companies is that security is their lifeline in their in their blood, right? So obviously if they get it wrong, it's a bad day for everyone. And they, you know, got it wrong to some extent, but they were much better prepared than your average company was to have the tools needed to earn the customer's trust back. And many of these other businesses that are in many respects, flying, flying by the seat of their pants for their security posture, especially in small business. Um, they have not invested their entire, entire livelihood in how to build the most secure thing. Um, and so uh, it's, it's it, much easier for a company not focused in security to permanently damage customer trust if they've lost customer data because they didn't invest the time or attention or you can prove negligence with rsa it's really hard for customers to look at that and say oh they were totally negligent like they had no idea what they were doing they abused my data why would i ever give my money to this institution um and you know not only that but rsa doubled down by releasing new products and capabilities that you know permanently address those types of vulnerabilities so it's one thing to say you're going to do it it's another thing to kind of double down I think they re if I remember correctly, when that happened, they reissued like all the tokens at no cost and invested in that next kind of platform. Um, So, yeah, valid counterpoint. Um, But I would say somewhat of an exception. Um, 
more interesting ones are to me ones like solar winds right like what's what's the 411 reputational aftermath of solar winds i haven't looked um since it has been a thing um but there's an example of a company that claims to have done um you know kind of that it infrastructure management and holistic um patch management, software management for industry, and a bunch of folks place trust in that platform. And the difference there was it wasn't like some fairly, you know, hard technical problem like RSA had to deal with. It was, oh, the intern put the default password on the update distribution server, and that allowed, you know, an attacker to put um, their malware in to in, in essence, infect the supply chain of what, what SolarWinds was delivering to um, lots and lots of companies. And so I, I don't have great, you know, reputational sentiment analysis, but I'm a betting man and I, you know, watch the stock market and believe that the stock market can tell us a lot about what customer sentiments and moods are for an industry. And if you look at, you know, SolarWinds at, um, December 11th, 2020, their share price was at 2483. If you look at the um, share price today, uh, February 16th, it's 1345 a share. So the company has lost about 50% of its net worth as a publicly traded company um, since December 28th. Um, and if we line that up to the breach, um, that breach occurred in um, May of 2019. Okay, so let's zoom back a little further. And in May of 2019, the share was at around $20 a share. So yeah, they seem to have rallied. They seem to have had a major pullback, but um, it's not clear to me. Like if, if someone told me, hey, do you recommend solar winds? Hell no. I, I wouldn't tell you to go buy that. I would tell you to keep arm's length away from that stuff, irrespective of whether or not they patched it, because it wasn't clear that they were um, they were being responsible with the, with the level of trust placed in them. Whereas like RSA was being responsible, they still damaged trust, but it's hard to argue that it was because of negligence, whereas solar winds in many respects was a, a big part in terms of the negligence on the company. John may have a point, you know, as we think about Equifax, uh, that the, didn't see a negative stock, you know, with their 2017 breach, didn't see a negative and, and are actually up over that. I, I do, um, to John's point a little bit, Christian, and to go back to the the, the data, the sixty eight percent increase in twenty twenty one, do you think there could be a little bit of, you know, public? I, we just can't handle apathy those kinds of numbers. <laughs> yeah, well, it. And I don't even. I wouldn't even say it's not caring. It's there's just so much of it. I can't keep track of it all. You know, I'll be honest. Until John mentioned Equifax just a minute ago, I was kind of like, oh yeah, I guess that did. I mean, that's a big deal. What happened? And I mean, it's like, well, you know, okay. Well, you mentioned solar winds. I remember thinking about that last year. Was that last year? See, I yeah, it remember. was a tw it was a twenty twenty one greatest hit. So I'm glad we're talking about it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But you're kind of like, uh, I, I kind of wonder from a public standpoint if these have gotten so spectacular. Or they've 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 written themselves out of the narrative because they're not, you know, they're just not that exciting anymore from a from a news cycle standpoint, people are like, well, okay, it's happening to everybody. We got to kind of figure this thing out, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I, I think that's fair. There's another interesting dimension to that example that John brings up, which is like um, credit bureaus. It's the tri-state credit bureau. It's a very vendor locked constrained space, much like, um, much like the cell phone space in the U S is like, you have three main providers now, like pick your poison. Um, and, uh, I think people have much more, um, choice in 
what they choose and what they pick um, for um, something like a software IT lifecycle management company like SolarWinds. So I think there's much more diversity there where people can choose to put their kind of their money elsewhere. Um, and tri-state credit bureaus, which are very regulated as they are, yeah. not like you and I are going and buying an Equifax product. We're kind of like, uh, you know, we're very impacted. They measure our credit scores, they report things out, but we're not really buying a product from them. So yeah. um, you and I don't get as much of an ownership stake in setting the direction of Equifax, so to speak, as maybe we do choosing security product A from security product B. Um, now I got my timelines a little bit backwards trying to do the solar winds timeline in my brain. Um, the, the news became public December 13th of 2020 and the public response began in December 15th of 2020. So 2021 was mostly like, let's clean up from all the solar winds things. Um, but if you look at this stock market ticker, Solar Winds had hit its highest share evaluation of 2483 on December 11th, 2020. So this is following very consistently, remind you, mind you, the kind of COVID crash and recovery in the broader market. Um, but they're at right up to the breach, have never been higher, right? 2483. Um, and then within, you know, by December 24th, which is now a week after public disclosure, they're down to 1661. So they've wiped, you know, uh, uh, about 40% of their um, market share out overnight. And the closest they rallied back very briefly was summer of 2021, kind of came back up, but now they're, you know, back down into this new low territory of 13. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. It clearly shows you that people were spooked by it. Uh, it's unclear. We'd probably need to look at another couple of years for this company's graph to really make a, a speculation. But um, I, I think this, I think ownership in, you know, do you have alternative options plays a big role in whether or not that customer trust actually results in the damage of people leaving your platform or your service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a good discussion, right? I don't think there's any clear, always a clear correlation, you know, to your point, say Verizon uh, was in the middle of a gigantic breach here in the United States. It's certainly going to take a hit. Is it going to, is it going to ruin them forever? Probably not. There's, yeah. they, 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 they hold the, you know, lion share control the cell phone market here in the United States. So you, you never, you, you don't really know. Right. I mean, I don't think you, that's one of those things you're like, ah, it'll be okay. Uh, well, our reputation will be fine. Let's let's not do that, right? I, I think that's the thing that you want to, you know, you want to guard against or what you're really kind of saying is, do you really want to roll the dice? You know, are you that interested in rolling the dice? Um, Brian had asked a question earlier, Christian. I think that's that's uh, maybe one we kind of wrap on uh, as we think about this. He says, but in thinking about this topic and possible cyber terrorism, I wonder how our infrastructure security compares to other nations. And, you know, I'm not asking you to break that down, but just as we think about the overall, you know, the United States has a huge footprint and a huge target. How do just just on the surface, how do we compare and and any any thoughts on that is we think because that's going to, you know, I think about what's going on in Ukraine right now. It's going to be a bigger and bigger deal when with these with these players. <sighs> It, it is it is super hard to speculate. Um, I, I, you know, in many respects, I, I, I sometimes wish we had uh, another 10 years of data to look at for the next 10 years to then see hindsight 2020 beforehand. So um, the crystal ball is a little bit hard on this one. Um, and, you know, there's there's this whole unrelated, you know, aspect to your question that I think influences the answer a little bit around how just geopolitical volatility in general will influence our supply chain, which will influence our decision-making and, and how we're building, securing and defending these systems. Right. So like we talk about, we talk about 
you know, Russia and Ukraine and, and you know, this, we've seen some of the accusations of cyber attacks there. But, you know, now, you know, it, w- let's play out a scenario where China decides to invade Taiwan and now 90 percent of the um, silicon chips needed to produce computers is not available for export. And like, what does that do to fundamental things that just kind of keep the lights on, yet alone um, actually build and, and create new security products that are going to improve this uh, landscape one way or another. So I don't know that I have a great answer there at the moment. Yeah. And, and not really expecting you to have one. I think the, the, you know, we, we still got a lot of things ahead on that, uh, on that front. And, um, you know, I, I, years ago we looked at a map, you know, that has, you know, I, I think that was, we looked at that on, on cyber frontiers here where it kind of shows attacks around the world as these things are happening yeah. kind of, kind of in real time. And, um, you know, it's, I, I haven't looked at that in a long time. I know. And uh, you, you got to kind of wonder now what it looks like, right? And what's yeah. changed. Well, uh, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, um, I would not be surprised if the volume of attacks hasn't changed, but the percentage of successful ones has, yeah. right? So yeah. just like in the Gmail example, right? Like people are probably still trying at the same volume as they were previously, but, now these strategies are failing. And so as they have to adapt their challenge strategies to be more sophisticated, I think you're going to see less volume because they're going to have to spend more time really crafting the right thing. So volume will go down. But when one of these things is right and it's and it's done at scale, um, in many respects, it takes away any kind of notion of an early warning indicator, right? Like, oh, we're seeing a lot of attacks from this source to this destination trying to do this thing. And well, now chances are, no, we're going to get more to a state where the, the name of the game is who can, you know, privately in their own confines um, of their hacker space come up with the next zero day that they can weaponize, prepare, and utilize um and you're not going to see it coming right there was no brute force testing of it it's just okay time to roll it out um so that map might look very different in terms of attempts but in terms of the players and the flows probably pretty similar yeah it'd be interesting to put a cost analysis on that to say what's the cost of the attacks because i think that that's what you're getting to is it's, it's costing more than more sophisticated requires more effort might mean more cycles, right? Some of the, even the human effort is getting harder and harder yeah. to, to trick, you know, humans into it. And so maybe they're just more costly um, as well, which ups the ante for everybody, right? It's, I think what we want, but it's just, ups the ante for everybody and makes those things more, which means the payoff needs to be more, right? Yeah. Needs to be deeper, <clears throat> needs to be bigger. Those well, and ransomware certainly has been a, a bigger, you know, way to get payoff on the cheap. Like you, you yeah. don't need to be broadly successful. You just need one that's willing to say yes to paying. Right. Right. And, right. and usually that is at a large sum. Um, there's going to be different types of payoffs though, as that becomes less and less viable. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Brian says, great response, Christian. I too think about the issue regarding the chip shortage and where they're manufactured linked to national security. Uh, they just announced Intel just announced a $20 billion, whatever. I forget the number in Ohio. Yeah. And you know, you kind of go, Oh, now you think about the rust belt, right? As you think about that part of the United States and it needing jobs and, you know, it could be a situation where some of those in, in that site that they picked, has potential to grow to 10 times bigger than it is today. That's just their initial investment. And interesting to see, we may see some of those chip manufacturers make their way back on shore and uh, see some things done here. Yeah. And I mean, it's a little bit of Looney Tunes speculation, but I mean, kind of stop and think about what happens when one geopolitical segment owns 
let's just say a broad portion of the supply chain. And so you're not able to get the parts that you need or the things that you need. Um, and then also like on the flip side of that argument, there's a lot of hardware coming from a lot of different places right now that is exported and imported accordingly that how do you vet that that chip is a Intel 12th generation processor to spec? Like, how do you know? Mm. Like, 99% of the people in the home or home enthusiasts building their computer, they're mm. not, you know, there's no, there's yeah. no assurance test that like, here's okay. the seal and it's no stick it in the motherboard and boot the thing. Right. So, um, yeah, no check the, some. <laughs> yeah. You from know? the perspective mm -hmm. of everyone dependent on these, uh, what I would call fairly brittle supply chains that oh. everyone, you know, whether they like it or not, they're using them. Um, there's something to be said for how do we get to the next state as industry at large for vetting things and having software vet that hardware is what it is, right? Like you should, you should be able to have your system know the difference between a legitimate or a fraudulent. And again, fraudulent defined as hardware modified in some way, whether that's firmware, mm. whether that's some change on the board itself, whatever, um, from its baseline. Um, and then on the flip side, you have a massive supply chain disruption and that changes over time. Who has access to what hardware at what scale doing what things? Um, and so some of these are short-term issues. Some of these are potentially long-term, but mm -hmm. I, I very much think a, who controls the supply chain and who is able to get parts when is a very important part of the discussion for understanding what will be the trend or pattern of attacks over time. Cause you can do different types of attack with different hardware. You're going to target different types of platform based on the probability of X chip versus Y chip being in those systems. Like there's a lot of weird niche analysis you get into when you just think about, okay, what does it mean for the supply chain sources to change from X to Y or from the volume to go up or down? Um, then there's the second meta point around just how do you validate and vet your hardware supply chain using software things and making it available to the average consumer so that they don't even, you know, they're not aware about it. It's almost like, you know, if you're running a illegitimate copy of Windows, like, you know, even if Microsoft lets you still run it, they're going to pop up and tell you, right? Like it's fairly, they can do that in their sleep and tell you if you're running a genuine copy, can we do that with arbitrary hardware parts today? Debatable for the, at, at the average guy level. Um, and is it baked into these products to the point where you'll know if there's a problem, if they tell you, but it's not like you have to go and do something as the mm -hmm. average guy. And then there's just this third, you know, segment of, yeah, what are, what are we really doing? Um, to you know, my, you know humorously much like blockchain decentralizing some financial um systems what are we really doing to decentralize our um supply chain and and chip capability uh really on a global scale to be quite honest right because it's very disproportionate uh, in terms of who's producing chips and exporting to who um and it's it's going to have major implications in the security space moving forward um, especially when you look at things like in 2020 Spelter, uh, Spectre and Meltdown, which were big deal topics, right? Um, and these were, you know, foundational security flaws in the hardware. Now, it wasn't like someone compromised or tainted the supply chain, but what if the story headline was um, Spectre and Meltdown caused not because of a firmware bug that's been pre-existing that Intel and AMD had, but because someone slipped it in and no one right. noticed right. or manufacturing plant X modified the boards and they, they slipped right through validation testing is right. good to go. And they, they now allowed this vulnerability to be there that otherwise wasn't designed for. Yeah. 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 Genuine testing, right. This uh, quality, not, not quality, but, but you know, does is this being delivered what it was intended to be, or has yeah. someone modified it in some way? And and look, when we talk about 
you know, kind of raising the standards and qualities of that basic infrastructure, you know, to the next level, to the next level. Um, it's not just the, okay, everyone does MFA and we get better and better at software. It, I mean, infrastructure is foundationally, it's going to be hardware just as much. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the economic, geopolitical and, you know, real world aspects of hardware supply chain um, have equally complex but different characteristics than software supply chain security but in the aggregate if your supply chain for these things is not healthy or not um verifiable at scale then your implementation of zero trust or any of these other things is only as good as you trust the vendors and the supply that's putting them in place how can i zero trust my iphone I have to have, like, I get the phone. I can't zero trust it. I'm trusting that the hardware, it, it, the, you know, the, the software may be easier to validate than the hardware on that one. Yeah. And I'm kind of, I can't put any zero trust in place for the hardware on that phone. So it's an interesting idea, I think, of from a consumer standpoint. How do I guarantee that the hardware being delivered to me does not have malicious built into it from the factory or built into it from a chip manufacturer that provided it at the factory. Right. And, and how do I know that, that, that phone's not going to turn on me, you know, at some point and, and guarantee it today. I think we take that for granted, Christian. I really do. I think we, we yes. just go, yep, <laughs> it's okay. I don't, you know, it's not like I boot the phone and then check it. <laughs> right. And maybe, maybe we should, right. Maybe there should be some kind of, authorization something to for the hardware well and i you know it's you know we're there's all sorts of things from a firmware level around like sign drivers and like you know like apple's obviously putting things in their sure, operating system sure. that they're gonna know if you're trying to boot it on something that's not an iphone but i'm yeah. talking about much more like minutiae sleight of hand things yeah. that right. um are you know in theory um, if you have a properly vetted firmware platform and, you know, uh, instruction, instruction set, you should be able to do complete proofs of your hardware. Right. But think about how especially married the iPhone software is to its hardware. And right. then think about how diverse the hardware to software ecosystem is in a lot of other types of systems um, where there isn't that very tight coupling and there's no real standard for how to do it when you're in those hybrid environments of, of software and hardware. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, it should have a way of uh, protecting me if there was some kind of hardware modification that was injected in, in some form or fashion that could be done, you know, even, even if we think about, you know, a Bluetooth injection, right. That flips something, in, the, in a hardware setting or whatever, I, you know, I'm making this up, but I don't have any kind of protection against that in some ways. If the, if at least today it's not zero trust for me on the hardware. So yeah, interesting stuff. Um, as we get together next month, you know, one of the things that's just driving me nuts uh, in this topic, and maybe we can just spend a little time talking about it is I do feel like, because of the supply chain problems, we're seeing in increased prices in computer parts. Mm -hmm. And then that's created a gray market that we're a problem. We're the problem because we keep buying these things off the gray market. Yeah. Or I, I know I think we need them, but we really don't. Right. I, 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 I kind of wish we could institute some discipline <laughs> in, in our own in our own purchasing problems to say, no, I'm not going to buy that thousand dollar Xbox. That's obviously because of a supply chain manipulation because of bots who have bought these things right before humans could. And then we're in, we're actually supporting that crime, that crime, right? I think it's a crime in some ways by buying these things that we really shouldn't be outside the supply chain, you know? So maybe we can, chat a little bit about that next time yeah i know absolutely um and and the consumer trends obviously play a big role in this too right because there's to your point um 
those gray markets are not easily disturbed. <laughs> um, yeah. It, well, and this, listen, the madness just around video cards. It's like, no, I need it now. Do you like, <laughs> do you really need it? No, I need it now. And you know, it was just one of those kinds of things like, um, no, I get, you're trying to, you know, you're trying to do some things, but just, just let's, let's let the, let's punish the people who have done this by not giving in. We have control over those kinds of things, right? Yeah. We control the supply and demand in a lot of ways. And let's punish those that overpaid or whatever. At some point, supply and demand will fix itself and make it right. It just drives me nuts to see. And I live in this space because all these YouTubers and stuff, you know, they're got to have it now. I'm like, no, you don't. You don't. You don't have to have it now type deal. It, let's have a little discipline in this, you know. Just drives me nuts. We'll talk about that. We'll, we'll bring that subject up. Uh, we will get you back here on a regular basis now, and we'll get at least one of these a month kind of schedule. I think that's probably the right pace for this and uh, and get some time together. Christian, thanks for coming back. Uh, thanks for doing 65 of these with me. Uh, tons of fun to think of. We've been doing this for well, seven years. No, eight seven years. years. Seven? Uh, <laughs> when I did you start? Because so. it was right, right before you started school, say right? I want to say it was, um, oh, maybe it was earlier. I thought it was 2015, but it's very possible. Back. Yeah, we'll have yeah. to go back and take a look. It's cool. Well, uh, thanks for coming out. A couple of reminders here. Of course, you know, the average guy.tv powered by Maple Grove Partners, secure, reliable, high speed hosting from folks that you know and that you trust. Maple Grove Partners.com. I think plans still as little as 10 bucks. In, it's more just inflation proof. Whipping <laughs> inflation. Just this, see, this is where you should spend your money, like I- inflation. Uh, uh, fighting inflation every day of the week. Uh, if you have questions, you want us to cover us a topic, send me an email, jim at theaverageguy.tv. You can contact Christian, Christian at theaverageguy.tv. Um, shoot us a note on Twitter at Jay Collison and Christian is at Ford Whisper. Thanks for coming out tonight. We'll stay around for just a minute or two of post show. With that, we'll say goodbye.